said, we live in a, a world in disarray where they're facing a lot of uh, disturbing problems, whether that's <coughs> political or as far as climate is concerned. Um, the world certainly is struggling to find positive direction forward. And it really wasn't much different in the times, of course, of Jehu. The nation was quite, quite chaotic and uh, people were trying to find direction forward. And it was supposed to happen, of course, under the leadership of King Jehu. And we're going to unpack tonight further events that happened uh, as he tried to restabilise the northern area of Israel. So we've had a look at in our previous sessions of selection, uh, the anointing of Jehu for this particular event. We've looked at his seriousness. Uh, he didn't sort of delay. He didn't shrug his shoulders and say too hard or, you know, I can't do this task. He, he focused on it particularly. Uh, last study we saw his strategy and tonight we want to have a look at this whole process of separation uh, and how in his particular perspective that sort of needed to happen. So previously as we've said, uh, Jehu had this commission to eradicate the dynasty of Ahab and we saw the death of two kings plus a queen um, and Jehu of course continues on this eradication process and with some justice of course the elders, the nobles, the princes in the area of Jezreel were also exterminated because of their murder of innocent Naboth. So there was a sense of justice as Jehu continued to carry that through. And we would have noticed in our last session, if you remember it, of course that little emphasis on the word letters. Uh, earlier in chapter 10 here, hopefully you've got it coloured in, letters were going backwards and forward. And of course that had an echo back to the letters that uh, Jezebel sent through to the elders there in Naboth, in Naboth's territory in Jezreel, uh, to uh, take Naboth and destroy him. So there's, there was some justice and sort of echoes certainly back from that particular event. However, we noticed the divergence, and I think there was a point last week where we saw he was in the shepherd's house there in verse uh, 12 and 13, and uh, verse 14 particularly, where perhaps Jehu now had to take leadership in a more positive role. And of course the shepherding aspect was particularly important introduced in the narrative there. Not only was he there to execute justice, but he's also to show now, well should have shown, a shepherding role to the nation and directed them in a positive way to the worship of God. But he had an obsession of course with violence. We'll see that more as this unravels tonight. And of course in our previous session there were some visitors coming up from Judah to uh, give their regards to king, the king, King Joram, but of course he took them out as well, which left a horrible vacuum down south in uh, the area of Judah, which the terrible, horrible Queen Athaliah then slew all her grandsons and she went onto the throne. So the, the repercussions were, were really quite horrific. And of course those 42 men were, were slain there by the cistern of Beth Eked. Well, you know, the, the story doesn't end there. And if you, you know, haven't had enough violence, well, there's going to be a little bit more tonight because that's what Jehu uh, determined to do with anyone who was not worshipping the God of Israel. So he now wanted to eradicate um, the, the complete worship of Baal. And his process was, of course, uh, to, to take as many people as he could to destroy them and to break down the temple. Uh, and that would then leave perhaps an opportunity for, for worship to begin. And he was quite violent in the way that he did that. So this, in a, in a way, was a divergence as far as Jehu was concerned because now he was actually eradicating the political infrastructure of the nation. He's basically wiping out all the, the ruling people, the princes and nobles, right through Samaria, right through that whole northern area. And of course that was also to destabilise anyone who may make a charge for the throne. So he's just you know, wiping as many people out as he could, both religious and in some senses non-religious as well. So this is the problem tonight, is that Jehu didn't stop his slaughter, he didn't give people an opportunity for repentance. And I think that's probably the underlining state that we need to make tonight. He just slaughtered people, if they're all there in the house of Baal, he killed a lot of them. So there was no opportunity for repentance at all. And this is going to be picked up in our final study and also in the prophecy of Hosea. So we can't deny that Jehu had an intense zeal for God and for the things of God. That's a, a given. But what he was deficient in was displaying the righteousness of God. That is the right living the ways of God. And for Jehu, 
I won't say it's an easy task, but his, his simple focus was just destroy anything that opposes God. And we know in our own lives, well, yes, that's part of the equation. That's part of our life. We've got to resist evil, but that's not the end story. We've got to replace that, of course, with, with worship, praise, honour, thankfulness, all the positive elements of why we love God. So there's a balance there that is needed. So in our session tonight, which begins, of course, in verse 15, we've got Jehu in his chariot again. I'm sort of amazed uh, how often Jehu, he seems to love this chariot, and he's there in his chariot again. Uh, verse 15 says, When he was departed thence, he lied on Jonadab and invited him into his chariot. So there he is again in his chariot. He's coming down to Samaria. He's not on his own this time. He's got Je Jehonadab or Jonadab, the son of Rechab, with him. And I think, again, this is another little instant, instance where Jehu could have had a, a profitable conversation with Jonadab, who was a very faithful and godly man, and that might have helped to write Jehu's direction. Jonadab, as we'll see, uh, we'll unpack a little bit tonight, was a very conservative brother, we might say, or, or man, uh, who had a, a very definite viewpoint of right worship of God. And uh, there was this conversation, this connection, with Jehu. Now we'll notice here in verse 15, and there's an important point here, in this first sentence or the first couple of phrases, verse 15, it says, when he was departed thence, he lighted on Jehonadab, the son of Rechab. Now I'm just going to stop on that word lighted because we sort of tend to think, well, you know, he just happened to be there and I, I guess, you know, that he just invited him in his chariot. It was all sort of pretty random. But if you look at the margin, you'll notice it's the Hebrew word found. So it almost indicates that there was a previous connection or at least a knowledge of Jehonadab. So this is uh, helpful for us as far as Jehu is concerned. He wasn't just a military person who was sort of in his chariot destroying everybody. He actually had contact points and people that he knew. And one of them was Jonadab. I'm going to say Jonadab, not Jehonadab, although I know that's in the record there in verse 15, but he's also called Jonadab um, in Jeremiah. And because I can say it short, I can pack more into my talk. <laughs> so anyway, he found, he found him there uh, in that verse uh, 15. And it's the same word met that we referred to back in chapter 9 and verse 21. Remember we said, I think it was our first study or maybe the second, that Jehu met King Joram and Ahaziah in the area of Naboth's vineyard. And it wasn't just a chance meeting. He actually wait, was waiting there for them. And that's where... Uh, the execution happened and, and justice was meted out. So he found him um, and they met there in this particular area of the shepherd house. And again, I think that's very important, that the narrative we talked about last week, uh, this house of the shepherds, this is the place where um, John Adab was. He was probably known as a point of, of connection because Jonadab came from a nomadic tribe, the Kenites. We're going to unpack this a little bit more tonight as to their very interesting background. The Kenites were a nomadic group. Uh, they didn't have any uh, central place where they, they dwelt. There was no city. In fact, that was the instruction that they should be nomads, wanderers, strangers, and they were shepherds as well. So perhaps, and it would seem very possible here, that the Kenites were gathering, you know, either to shear the sheep or perhaps to water the sheep, and this is where they, they connected. And so this, this shows really that deeper connection that Jehu had. Uh, as we said, beyond military matters, he understood, he knew the reputation, he knew the reputation of John Adab, and he searched him, he met him, he found him, he invited him to the chariot. So there's a very strong connecting point to the influence, and we might even say the expertise of John Adab that he was connecting to and inviting to be part of this movement. So John Adab was a man of remarkable strength and fortitude. He instructed his family, and those instructions carried on for another 250 years. So he wasn't the sort of person who was just about exterminating and, and had a negative view of the truth. He instructed his family, and for another 250 years and beyond, because it's 250 years um, to, the, to the time of Jeremiah, um, he, he was a very positive person as far as the truth was concerned and the following generations. So the question is, as we look at the narrative here in verse 15, uh, about halfway through verse 15, a very probing question. Jehu says, is your heart right as my heart is with your heart? Is your heart right? Now, I guess on the background of that, 
there's the essence of pride, perhaps, a little bit of self-presumption, maybe even arrogance, we could say, because here's Jehu, he's, he's slaughtering, he's wiping out people left, right and centre, he thinks he's doing the will of God, and he, and he turns to uh, Jehonadab, or Jonadab, and he says, is your heart right as my heart is? So there's a little bit of pride that's surfacing here. Interesting, isn't it? Because really, that's the question that Jesus asked Peter. Remember, Peter said, although these disciples uh, might forsake you, Lord, I won't, I'll be there. You know, if I have to give my life up, I'll be there with you. And then, of course, it all went wrong. And then Jesus was resurrected. Remember the walk on the beach with Peter up by the Sea of Galilee? And Jesus asked Peter three questions, or three times he says, is your heart right with me, didn't he? He said to Peter, do you love me? And they were very probing questions, all about attitude, really. It's not about what's on the outside or sometimes even what we appear to be doing. It's, you know, right on the inside is your heart right. And we ask that question of ourselves, hopefully, every Sunday morning. You know, is our heart right? Have we been faithful? Have we not only eliminated or, or contained things that we shouldn't be doing, but actually have we put into place some generosity or some, put some support of other brothers and sisters in a positive way as far as the truth is concerned. And the other thing I think as far as Jehu is concerned, which is a good thing, do we actually seek out appropriate friendships that are helpful for us in the truth? You know, or do, do we just float through life and you know, have a few conversations? Or, or do we seriously try and nurture and develop those friendships that are particularly important uh, when we don't know what to do in a particular situation? So this is the question that Jehu asks of Jonadab, come and see my zeal. Now a little colouring and exercise which is really good because this is where we see Jehu's attitude and his heart was really not quite right because you see this word my and me, it's all about him. So definitely worthwhile colouring in all these little personal pronouns here because immediately this opens up and as he reaches down for Jonadab, he says, your heart right with my heart. Look at what I'm doing. It's all about me, my chariot, where I'm going. So you can already see in the narrative here that there's a little bit of self-presumption as far as his direction is concerned. Come and see my zeal. And of course, that's a question that we need to ask ourselves. And certainly here's a couple of good cross references to go in the margin there. And one, of course, is about the Apostle Paul, or Saul, as we do know. He was on a similar course. Remember, there's almost a parallel in the New Testament. The man Saul, you know, Pharisee of the Pharisee, what was he doing? He was going around exterminating the early Christians because he thought that was the right thing to do. And so he writes about his heart, his attitude, his life a little bit later on in Philippians. He says, concerning zeal, you know, now he's embarrassed because he said, I was persecuting the ecclesia. And touching the righteousness which is the law, I thought I was blameless. Well, he got it all wrong, and Paul acknowledges that. And again, uh, as far as the Jewish people are concerned, in Romans 10 verse 2, he says, I bear them record that they've got a zeal for God, but it's not according to, to knowledge. So, you know, the, this whole culture, as far as Israel is concerned, they've got their festivals that they still keep, uh, but it, it's, it's not appropriate, it's not according to a proper understanding and acceptance of the God of Israel. And the, the Jewish people are very much secular people and a lot of their rituals are just that, they're rituals and they, they don't mean much else. But here's a couple of quotations as well on the positive side as far as zeal, because you know, we need to say, is zeal a good thing? Maybe, you know, was Jehu right in ha having this energy and this zeal? Well, yes, he was. So. Here it says in John chapter 2 and verse 17, his disciples remembered, the zeal of your house has eaten me up. Now, Jesus Christ was energetic and enthusiastic. He had a zeal and a love for God's house. So it's not as though we should put that aside and say, well, you know, I need to be a nebulous person. Um, you know, a little bit of apathy doesn't go astray, a little bit of monotony. No, we don't want that at all. We want to actually flip to the other side. We still want to be zealous, but in a, in a right way. Uh, Galatians 4 and verse 18 said, It's good to be zealously affected, uh, always in a good thing, not only when I'm present with you. So he's writing to the Ecclesia in Galatia, and he says, I don't want to just see you enthusiastic when you've got a special weekend or a special effort on or a camp. You need to be consistent in your zeal and your love of God. Titus 2 verse 14. Uh, Christ gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a special people, zealous, of good works. 
and that's ourselves. And again, he repeats this, our Lord Jesus Christ says in Revelation 3.19, as many as I love are rebuke and chase, and so be zealous. So, you know, we can't look at Jehu and say, well, he was just a bit over the top, he needed to calm down a bit. No, he needed not to calm down, he needed to just direct it in the right manner. And for ourselves, of course, let's not discard this aspect of zealousness and enthusiasm. Now, you know, do people see our zeal for God? Because that's the question that Jehu said uh, to Jonadab. Look at me, look at what I'm, I'm doing. Um, is it seen in positive and negative ways in our lives? And again, living the truth doesn't have to be a showy display, does it? It can be a quiet, consistent, faithful activity. Brother John Sebazic, who's fallen asleep over the last week or so, is, isn't he a great example of zeal? Like he wasn't out there showy, uh, verbalising everything, but he was there for a quarter of a century almost, down that back corner there, 25 years plus, attending every single meeting, recording, taping, running the microphones for us. What a great service. What an amazing zeal. What a, what a lovely enthusiasm and what consistency. So it doesn't have to be up in a chariot, busy showing to everyone. It can be here with consistent attendance and conversation, a love of God which people will see. Well, in verse 16, <clears throat> Jehu puts his hand down. He, he, he lifts him up into the chariot, into verse 15. And uh, in verse 16, it says, come, come with me and see my zeal for Yahweh. And I also, you know, this little next phrase is sort of interesting in the King James Version. It says, so they made him ride in his chariot as though, as though he wasn't quite sure whether he wanted to go with Jehu and probably at the end of this journey he would have preferred to stop in his tent because it wasn't probably you know, the best Saturday afternoon outing that he'd have in his life. But um, it almost seems to be a sense of reluctance in some ways. They made him ride in his chariot. So this is Jonadab. So Jonadab's name, or Jehonadab, means Yahweh is willing. And Rechab, he's the son of Rechab, it means, interesting, to ride. So when you put those two names together, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, it means Yahweh is willing to ride, and I'm going to add, if Jehu's attitude was correct. Now there's an additional play on words in the Hebrew because the word ride, there in verse 16, is also, it's, it's an associated word, it's the word Rechab. It's the root word of um, uh, Rechab's name. And the word chariot there as well <coughs> is the word Rechab. Slightly different Hebrew word, but they're all interconnected. They're almost the same. So there's a complete play on words here. Yahweh is willing to ride, to ride, to ride. And the lesson here is, yes, Yahweh was willing to go to ride, in a sense, with Jehu in his work, if his attitude and his direction was correct. And I think Jonadab was placed there to try and give a correction to Jehu's obsession, which we notice because Jonadab only appears for a couple of verses here and then again in verse 23 and he disappears from the record uh, and doesn't resurface until we get to Jeremiah chapter 35. So it's almost as though Jehonadab is put in this position to help correct Jehu's obsession. And, you know, brothers and sisters do that in our lives, don't they? Sometimes we get focused or we've got a problem or we've got an issue and we're sort of going down this way and someone, maybe a husband or wife, says to us, hey, just step back a little bit and have a think about the bigger perspective of, of what's going on here. And it's so helpful sometimes to have that information from another person, another third party, someone who's seeing it from a, a different viewpoint to help correct perhaps an obsession that, that we have with a particular aspect of life. So I want you to come across to Jeremiah 35 because I think we're going to learn this very wonderful man, his spiritual maturity, his depth, and the influence that he had on his family. And there's a couple of little colouring and exercises we can do here in Jeremiah 35, some key words that will help open up who was this Jonadab, the son of Rechab. So first of all, just a very simple overview of who he was. So we've got a timeline here. So you might remember right back in the book of Exodus, when Moses, was, uh, Moses went out into the wilderness of Midian, he actually married into this tribe of the Kenites. Um, Jethro was, of course, the father-in-law of Moses. He married Zipporah. Okay, so Zipporah was a daughter of Jethro. 
Hobab, who's also mentioned, is Moses' brother-in-law. All right, so there's a family line here that's connected to Jethro. Down the line a little bit is Heber, mentioned in Judges. Remember, Heber was not quite as faithful as Jael, his wife, who destroyed Sisera. And coming out of this family line, of course, is Rechab, and here it is, Jehonadab. So that's the family line. So here's just a snapshot. You'll notice back in around about 1,500 years before Christ, this is where we first get introduced to the family line. Uh, they're mentioned in Judges. Here's where we are in 2 Kings. And here's where they're mentioned by Jeremiah. This is 250 years later. So a very, very faithful family. In fact, it even goes beyond that. So here's just a, perhaps a, a, a more detailed snop, snapshot. Uh, here in Exodus, we've already said Moses meets and he, he's called Ruel, who means a friend of God. He's the priest of Midian. So Moses married into this family. Um, and then, of course, there was some advice given. Jethro gives some advice. Remember, Moses is wearing himself out. Um, he's leading this whole group through the wilderness. There's lots of issues. There's almost like two million people. And Moses is wearing himself out. And Jethro comes and gives him some very wise advice. He says, why don't you appoint 70 elders to, to help you with you know, these particular issues? Uh, Moses asked Hobab, who is his brother-in-law, to travel with him. Look, you know the wilderness, you can navigate for us, you'll be very helpful for us. And in that particular reference there, um, we're not quite sure whether he went because he says, no, I think I've got you know, my own family, I need to tend to my, my, uh, my area of life. But there in Judges, we see that he did go and the Kenites were there with, with the tribe of Judah. Again, just I referenced um, Heber, who separated himself, um, but of course, um, Jael, his wife, maintained the family values. She destroyed Sisera in quite a, a, a difficult way. Um, here, Saul advised the Kenites to move. He's going to destroy the Amalekites. So he said, you need to, because you're a, a godly people and you're associated with that, you need to get out the area because I'm going to come through and destroy the Amalekites. Um, here we've got a list in the chronology that they're included with the tribe of Judah. So the chronicler puts all the tribes of Judah, their families, and he includes, he includes the Kenites. And here's where we are tonight. There's the first mention of Jehonadab or Jonadab, 250 years before Jeremiah 30. So very consistent, very faithful. Uh, and here he is mentioned here. And then in Nehemiah, quite interesting, um, one of the descendants, we've got Malchiah, the son of Rechab, repaired the dung gate, willing to take on the worst. So this is even after they've been sent across to Babylon, and now they return, and the Kenites, the descendants of Jehonadab, the Rechabites, still there with, with the nation of Israel. So quite a remarkable history. So this is the, um, this is the thing we can, we can colour in, in in Jeremiah 35, is the word father. So this is the first point I just want to pick out. So verse 6, 7, 8, 10 and 18 have a reference to Jehonadab our father. Now, the nation of Israel hasn't been faithful as far as their worship is concerned. So God said to Jeremiah, I want you to uh, visit the Rechabites and place before them wine. And they had a very strict law, family law, that they were not to take alcohol. And even although uh, uh, an outstanding prophet said, here's some wine, let's you know, have a conversation and have this wine. They said, no, our father instructed us not to. That's, that's 250 years before. I mean, I can't even wind back 250 years to my uh, you know, great, 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 great grandfather. So quite an amazing faithfulness. And they had a respect for Jehonadab. They call him our father. So it's not as though there's just a, a list of rules and regulations. It's like, well, our father gave this and we understand the reason why. It's living a godly life. So this is the positive aspect of you know, service to God. And the other thing is this word all. So they didn't just take little bits in a way like Jehu and say, well, I'm happy to destroy people and that's, that's my you know, forte in life. <laughs> um, it, it's this word all. All that he hath charges, to drink no wine all our days. We've done all that he said. We've kept all his precepts and done according to all he has. So there's an element of great faithfulness in the descendants of the man who stepped into the chariot with Jehu 250 years later. So the point is, of course, 
they lived the truth. And the Rechabites had a, a law or a principle or a value in life that they would abstain from liquor, that they would live a nomadic life in tents, <clears throat> they would avoid city living, and they would depend on God for their sustenance. So they separated in some senses from the people of Israel because they wanted to maintain their faithfulness. So this is the lesson to Jehu, is that they were living the truth in a positive way, not just going around destroying others. They, they integrated in some sense into the people of Israel and they lived it in a positive way as a demonstration of their, their love for God. So the other aspect which is important as well is this little um, phrase, we've done it, we've performed it. So you see, the truth wasn't just a matter of theory for them. They were actually doing it. And again, this is a point for Jehu. You know, it's not just going around executing people. It's actually living and doing the truth. And so this phrase, again, comes out in verse 10, 14, 16 and 18. We've done it. We're doing it. We're living the truth. So they, uh, they treated Jonadab and their forefathers with great respect. They were faithful to all the commands that were given. And they lived those commands. It wasn't just lip service for them. So again, you know, there's exhortations that filter down to us. You know, it's not just a matter of us taking the or reading about the values of the word of God. We actually got to live them and do them and be them. And that was the house of the Rechabites, a very, very faithful house. In fact, what's sort of interesting is the way that they're described there in Jeremiah 35. It's always the house or the family of the Rechabites. So it wasn't about individuality. When Jehu came, it was all about him as an individual. That's about it. But the house of Rehab, or Rechabites, were, were a family. And so we've got this phrase constantly, the house of the Rechabites. They bring them into the house of Yahweh. They, they were connected, house of the Rechabites, again. But when you come over here to Second the Kings that we've been looking at tonight, it's the house of Baal. All right, so there's a, there's a great sort of contrast and a difference there. So we're coming back to uh, 2 Kings chapter 10 just to pick up, and that was just sort of a little divergence to, to show the character and really the purpose of Johanadab and you know what could have been a, a very interesting and helpful conversation to realign Jehu into a proper course in life. Well, what happens? Well, we come back, uh, of course, and in verse 18... We read this uh, next little scenario that um, he gathered all the people together, 2 Kings 10, verse 18, and he says, Well, Ahab served Baal a little, gee, who's going to serve him much? So there's, there's some treachery and intrigue going on here. He particularly wanted to destroy this temple because this temple was actually built by Ahab for Jezebel. 1 Kings 16, verse 32 says, Ahab reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. So in some senses, when anyone looked at this particular temple, uh, that was a representation of really of Ahab and Jezebel and their religion. So Jehu wanted to remove any, any evidence of, of their existence, I guess, and their worship. So again, we're going to come to this little scenario where there was no opportunity given for people to repent. And this is where I think Jehu went far beyond his responsibility of just removing the dynasty of Ahab and Jezebel. Now he's spreading it out in a very destructive manner. So we notice uh, an interesting little phrase in verse 19. It says there, Now therefore call unto me all the prophets of Baal, all his servants and all his priests. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. All the prophets and priests of Baal, I thought they would have disappeared because if you knew Jehu was thundering around on his chariot, you know, exterminating everything that he saw. If I was a prophet of Baal, I'd be hightailing it right out of the, you know, right out of the nation into some little hidey hole in, you know, the Bahamas. <laughs> well, maybe that's a bit exaggeration, but, um, you know, you, you wouldn't want to hang around Samaria if you were a prophet of, of Baal. You know, you'd think they'd disappear, fled from the violence of Jehu. But here they are, they all emerge, and in fact, the temple's just absolutely packed, full of people full of worshippers and, and priests and, and prophets of Baal. This is, this is quite strange, isn't it? Well, it's not strange because the parallel is sin itself, isn't it? These people, of course, the, the, the worshippers of Baal, 
a representation of sin itself. It just doesn't go away. It never seems to disappear. Jehu might have gone through and sort of exterminated some of it, but they've all just, they've all just popped back up again. And isn't that like sin in our own lives? You know, we, we think we've got a little victory and we sort of rejoice and celebrate that, and before we know it, we're, we're back into the same rut, trying to dig ourselves out. You know, the Apostle Paul found that. He found that sin just kept reappearing, just like the prophets of Baal. Romans 7, verse 15 to 25, I won't go there, but he says, you know, I, I struggle with sin. It's a war that's going on. I find I'm not, I'm not winning, and I find it frustration, frustrating. I think I have a victory, and then, you know, I, I get distracted. And it's just so annoying. How am I going to get victory? Only through Jesus Christ. So Paul, you know, describes in a similar way these prophets of Baal, or sin, as it were, just popping up. And don't we find that, brothers and sisters? You know, on a Sunday morning we come in, we're quite confident. We commit to a new life, the week that's going to be ahead of us. We're going to serve God faithfully. Uh, and then by, you know, Tuesday and Wednesday, the old ways have kept back in. And by Friday and Saturday, uh, we're back to our normal old self. <laughs> and it's like a bit of a cycle, isn't it? So for, for the people of Israel, uh, unfortunately, these prophets of Baal were still there. Well, Jehu says in verse 19, he then goes on, he says, look, gather, gather them all together, in the middle of verse 19, I've got a great sacrifice to do to Baal. Well, I think there's a bit of irony or a bit of sarcasm here because there was going to be, as far as his plans were concerned, there was going to be a big sacrifice, there was going to be a lot of people were going to be killed. But I think the record says um, he did this subtly. Verse 19, just about three quarters of the way through. He did this subtly. I think that's a bit soft. You know, the King James is a little bit soft, really. Um, it's the only occurrence of the Hebrew word, Ochba, and our lexographers tell us it's the root word for the word Jacob, or the name of Jacob, who was the heel catcher. Remember, that's what his name means. Remember, he's always battling out with Esau, and, and he lived a life of intrigue and deception. This is that same word here, that word um, subtlety, it's connected to the root word of Jacob. It means to be treacherous, to be deceitful, to be dishonest. And that's exactly where Jehu was going down that pathway. He wasn't emulating the integrity and justice of God. He's now going down a pathway of dishonesty. Because as the king, he could have destroyed the idols and commanded people everywhere to repent, to think about their ways and to change their lives. He didn't give them that opportunity. He just slaughtered them all. So he was more focused on a massacre of people and destruction than he was on building and rejuvenating people up in the right way of worship. And of course, um, we need to be people that are prepared to allow new opportunities, well, for ourselves and for other people as well, to rebuild their lives. Well, the thing that's um, particularly interesting when we come to verse um, verse. 21, the end of verse 21. So this invitation goes out for a solemn assembly. Verse 21, he sent it through all Israel. Uh, and here they all are, the worshippers of Baal in verse 21. And the end of verse 21 is interesting. It says, the house of Baal was full from one end to another. Uh, might be an illusion, perhaps. Remember, there was a house that was full of people that were destroyed back in the times of Samson? Judges 16, 27. It says the house was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there, and they were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women. So back in the times of Samson, Judges 16, 27, a parallel situation almost. And remember, Samson pushed on the pillars and, and the whole lot destroyed uh, these, again, worshippers of Baal. But this particular word, and if you look in your margin, you'll have the Hebrew um, means mouth to mouth. So the idea is that it's full to the brim. The Gesenia says from one corner to another, uh, and the idea of a cup that's full up to the brim from, you know, you can put your mouth on one side and it's full or around the other, it's full up. So the house was packed, packed full. And the same Hebrew word is used, 2 Kings 21, 16, in the word, it's the word filled. It says there, moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much till he filled Jerusalem from one end to another. So if you know a little bit about Manasseh, very brutal king, similar attitude initially to Jehu, who just slaughtered the prophets of God. And the narrative says he just spread that blood all through the streets of Jerusalem. Filled is the word. 
So this is the word uh, here. So, you know, here's the question. Why isn't our hall filled tonight? You know, here are people that are enthusiastic about their worship of Baal and they've packed their hall full of people because the invitation has gone out. And we do have to think about, well, you know, the zeal of Jehu is, is certainly an important part of our own lives. You know, what, why isn't this hall packed full tonight? I mean, we drive past mega churches with you know people, thousands of people in attendance with you know, a whole variety of different things that they're doing and people are passionate and enthusiastic. You know, are we? I mean, I'm preaching to the converted here because you guys are here, so <laughs> you know, wasted breath really. But it's a sort of a, a thought process, isn't it? Are we th really enthusiastic or zealous to get together, to have fraternal time together, to study the word together, to worship God together? These are just integral parts of what a passionate person does. Of course, we live individually in our lives, but what a privilege and honour to get together and worship God and study God together. It's really important. And of course, we've got to think about future generations. You know, as the seats get emptier and emptier and the hall gets less and less, you know, and I know we're not going to go for another 250 years, but I'm just paralleling with Jehonadab and his generations went for 250 years of faithfulness. Would that happen here? So, you know, it's a question we need to ask and we need to have an input positive way as well. Anyway, the house was full to the brim. And so the command goes out in verse 22. He said unto him that was over the vestry, bring forth the vestments. Well, you know, what's a vestry? I guess we don't use that word often. So it's just a store chamber where obviously many of the religious items and the robes were kept. Now, we don't use the word vestibule. I think Sister Kerry does, but we normally say foyer. But there's this word vestibule, which I think has overtones to a church. Uh, so I don't, you know, prefer not to use it. But uh, it's, it's related, of course, and this word vestments is, is related to all the ornate garments and the distinctive sacred robes. So here it is here, of course, and um, these worshippers of Baal had distinctive robes that they would put on. So here they are. Here, this is the Russian Orthodox Church. This is their robes. And you'll see the little, that's, that's the Russian um, identification there on their particular robe. So this is you know, how they dress for a particular process of worship. What's really interesting about this is there's a bit of contrast between the robes that the priests of Israel wore. So here is this um, word again in Zephaniah 1 and verse 8. It says, It will come to pass in the day of Yahweh's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children and all who are clothed with strange apparel or vestments. So this is this same word here okay so they're bringing out these vestments this strange apparel what's interesting is when we wind back up a couple of verses from zephaniah chapter 1 and verse 4 it says i will stretch out my hand upon judah and all the inhabitants of jerusalem and i will cut off the remnant of baal from this place and the name of the Kemerims. Kemerims? what's all that about well interesting because here it's the hebrew word kamar kamar <coughs> it's the root word from a Hebrew word meaning black. So they're black garments, uh, which they wore, or the marks which they branded on their foreheads. Adam Clark, who's a commentator, um, says, why should we imitate in our sacerdotal dress these priests of Baal? It's strange to think hard and tell. So what he's saying <coughs> in modern worship, why do our priests walk around in black you know, robes? Because that's a connection back to the Cameron, who were uh, the worshippers of Baal and not faithful people. And then, of course, we've got a little comment related to the black frocked priests in contradistinction to the white gowned Levites and priests of Israel. One symbolised sin, the other symbolised righteousness. So these vestments were got out and, of course, uh, they put on all these um, robes and they were going to worship their god Baal. Now, interesting little point in verse 23 and there's a contrast here. <clears throat> Jehu gives the command, well, make, let's make sure there's no servants of Yahweh amongst them. We don't want to get them mixed up. It's all about separation because, well, he had a plan, of course. So he wanted to make sure there were no servants of Yahweh. Now, I just think it's interesting. I'm just going to draw the contrast between beginning of verse 23 or halfway through. It says, the worshippers of Baal, 
But at the end of verse 23, it doesn't say worshippers Yahweh, it says servants of Yahweh. Okay, so there's a bit of a difference there. They're the worshippers Baal, they've come in to worship a false god. But the people of Yahweh are described not as worshippers, but as servants. All right, so there's a servant aspect to the worship of God. Well, of course, it's quite violent. We, we notice in verse 24 that Jehu has 80 men now with him. So he's, he's, he's not on his own. He's not just riding around in a chariot on his own. He's now got 80 men, which is quite a bit, and um, quite a considerable force because he's going to advise these men they've got to go in and slaughter. You can imagine just how bloodthirsty and how terrible this whole process is. So in verse 25... Um, it came to pass as soon as he's made an end of offering the bird offering that Jehu said to the guard and the captain now that word guard the Hebrew word is runners okay so it's given to the bodyguard of the king normally who ran alongside the chariot or ran alongside and the same word is used we won't go here 1st Samuel 22 verse 17 it's where Saul said to, to his men to his guard turn and slay the priests and if we went back there, you'll notice in the margin it has runners. Okay, so this was the generally the bodyguard that would run alongside the, the king or the authority to protect him. And Jehu had 80 of these. They're runners. And of course, while well, they're going to do more than running, they're going to run in and, of course, slay the people, which is quite horrible. And the record at the end of verse 25 says, I want you to run in, kill them with the edge of the sword. And the, rec the narrative says, and the guard and the captains cast them out. So, you know, it's quite graphic. They're just slaughtering people there and the bodies are getting thrown out of the temple. So this is just quite violent. And again, at the end of verse 25, it's got, and they went to the city of the house of Baal. Well, it's not so much the city. I think the ESV has the inner room, or what we might say, the Holy of Holies. So they penetrated all the way through and cleaned that whole place out with slaughter. So this is where Jehu really went quite wrong. And I've tried to emphasise and underline tonight that he did not give people the opportunity for repentance. That's the important criteria. Jehu was just obsessed with killing people that had any connection to Baal. So this is where he went uh, particularly wrong. And we'll consider in our next session, of course, the, the end of the chapter where there's a bit of a summary of his life and we'll, we'll cross over to the Hosea. But the, the end of the story, which, again, is quite graphic and and fairly negative, is verse 27. It says, They break down the image of Baal and the house of Baal, and they made it a draft house unto this day. They made it a sewer. So they just destroyed it. Not only did he destroy it, he completely desecrated it. One commentator says this, To say he made it a refuge dump is literal, uh, and he made it into a public toilet. And then he says, A place for human excrement. So the, all, the virgin, all the versions understand it. Nothing could be more degrading than this. So, you know, this is the end of the study. It finishes on a, you know, focus on the toilet, which is really, really bad. But, you know, that's how the breakup works. Um, so, yeah, he destroyed the, the temple and just turned it into a public toilet. Just really horrible. Um, but very interestingly, they found a toilet. 2,500 years old, which is pretty interesting. Not here, of course, up in Samaria. It's actually down in Lakish. So in 2016, here's the toilet here. <laughs> Doesn't look that comfortable, eh? <laughs> 2016, archaeologists working at uh, Lakish made a, well, I don't know about amazing, made a discovery. They found a toilet in an ancient Baal shrine. Site is dated around the time of Hezekiah. They did some tests on it. I hate to think what the tests were like. Uh, but they said it was never used, it was only a symbolic gesture. Though this is not the toilet Jehu... I don't know why they got used there. <laughs> I might have to grammatically change this. <laughs> he ruled uh, 130 years before Hezekiah. It showed that turning Baal temples into outhouses is one way Israel commonly desecrated pagan temples. In contrast to Hezekiah, the Bible suggests the Israelis regularly used the Baal temple as an outhouse for years in Jehu's day. So, you know, what, a, what an amazing and quite a negative end, really, to this whole little story. Rather than offer people an opportunity for salvation and, and renewal and rebuilding, he ended up just destroying them, desecrating it and turning it into a public toilet. So you can see where, you know, a slight divergence ends up, you know, in this particular position here. 
So what, uh, what lessons have we learnt tonight? Well, I think four lessons, three or four lessons. Jehu prided himself in his fastidious zeal for destruction. However, do we show any zeal in a positive and active way for the things of God? So let's not look at Jehu's life and just say, well, you know, he was just overly zealous. He needed to calm down a bit. Uh, we still need to have a passion and a love and an energy and enthusiasm for the things of God. Let's not let that drift. Jehu found, and we made the point, he actually met, he connected, he knew this man. Jehu found and had a connection with Jonadab, a faithful family man. Do we seek out friendship and appreciate advice from those well-grounded in faithful service? It's really, really important to get good perspectives in life. So often we go off on a little tangent because we, we, we miss focus and we've got tunnel vision. And we need that broadness, which is great in ecclesial life. We've got a lot of different brothers and sisters we can get advice, weigh it up and be discerning. The Rechabites lived the truth for hundreds of years. Are we confident that our successive generations will hold the truth? You know, as parents, as grandparents, are we living a good life that will will uh, distill into our grandchildren or to the young people, if we've got families here, to the new generation, the young ones? Uh, that's important. The Baal worshippers, remember, they filled the house from brim to brim. They were excited about their worship practices. What passionate input do we have and how do we feel about worship, study and involvement when attendance is declining? Do we really have an input? Are we really concerned? Are we enthusiastic? Do we want to get together? I mean, COVID, I know COVID hasn't been done with because all the new stats are coming out today about you know, this third wave that's going through. But we sort of had a bit of a break during COVID. You know, have we regenerated ourselves in the joy and the privilege of fellowship? Well, they're the lessons of Jehu, uh, the determination that he had. Let's think about his life but let's make our direction a positive one as far as our service to God is concerned.